Greetings Institute personnel, my name is Bife here. Today I've been invited here by the Institute leadership to provide an overview to a critical event in the alternate universe of Destiny, the Battle of the Twilight Gap. Few events in the history of the Sol system would have such a profound influence on the remnants of humanity and the aggressive alien invaders from the depths of space that they did battle with that day. This battle is in many ways about not only the warring nations and the resources or location that they fought over, but it's also about a pair of cultural narratives and beliefs which, until perhaps centuries later, would be completely incompatible with one another. The battle would go on to become legendary in many respects, not only for the scale of the conflict or for what was at stake, but also for the heroes that fought there that day and the weapons that would be forged in its aftermath. I can think perhaps of no event that more dramatically defined the overall struggle of humanity in the alternate universe of Destiny, one where our back is against the wall and where a small number of legendary protectors might keep the hope of tomorrow alive. But to understand the battle, you first need to understand the two opposing sides in the conflict, what they had in common, and why they were fighting in the first place. Perhaps more specifically, you need to understand what the two opposing sides were fighting over. To condense things quite simply, and to keep a somewhat human-centric view, it all started with the enigmatic sphere known to humanity as the Traveler. It arrived in the Sol system in the early 21st century above the red planet Mars, and it would accelerate humanity's development as a species, bringing about a golden age of prosperity. But this was not the first time that the Traveler had uplifted a civilization. In fact, we were only the latest in a long series of species that the Traveler had blessed with its light. Unfortunately, the story of each of these civilizations would be bleak and would be quite similar to the fate of everyone who had come before. Whilst all of them would rise to great heights and would see their own golden age, such days were ultimately numbered. The Traveler had an ancient enemy, one who was diametrically opposed to it. It would be known by many names, from the Whirlwind to the Black Fleet to the Black Edge to the Pyramids. Most, however, would simply know it as the Darkness. The unrelenting armada of monolithic pyramid ships would hunt the Traveler from system to system, and wherever the Traveler uplifted a civilization, the darkness would just as quickly extinguish it when it arrived. Such would be the fate of every species that the Traveler had uplifted, and humanity seemed set to join these many extinct races were it not for the events that occurred on Earth. Exact records of what occurred are not clear, but what is most commonly believed is that the Traveler sacrificed itself to defeat the darkness and to save us, all but dying in the final moments of a cataclysmic battle that ended the collapse of human civilization. Slowly but surely, as humanity regrouped and civilization returned from the wilds, a community began to grow beneath the Traveler's final resting place. This community would grow into a village, then a township, and then a bastion it would come to be known as the Last City. Along its walls, great defenses and towers would be built, and humanity would continue to survive by eking out a living in this last stronghold. This feels like a very common and quite understandable human story, the story of humanity as survivors. But humanity in this instance were not the only survivors in this story, and though they were the first that the Traveler had supposedly sacrificed itself for, they were not the first to see the benefit of its great power. Across the void of space, there was another species that had been previous beneficiaries of the Traveler's influence. To humanity, they would be colloquially known as the Fallen, a title that we gave to them. However, their true name was the Elixni. At their true height, when fully developed, they would stand between 7 and 10 feet tall, and had four instead of two arms. They were resourceful, communal, dexterous and highly skilled with machinery. They used to know the Traveler as it provided for them in their own system, and allowed them to establish a multi-system empire. It was known to them as the Great Machine. But the Elixni's time with the blessings of the Great Machine were numbered, and ultimately the apocalyptic forces of the Darkness came to destroy their civilization as it had done with countless others. However, whilst many of their species would stand and fight to the bitter end as the forces of darkness came to snuff out their system, some Elixni houses rallied together and made the difficult choice to abandon their home system and pursue the Traveler across space. 
On this long and harrowing journey, the Elixni devolved culturally, and went from a social and generally caring, compassionate structure to one that could best be described as brutal and despotic. In the long, dark voyage between the stars, they turned from a once noble and proud people into nothing more than pirates, and their once wise and pious leaders, known as Kells, would turn into petty warlords. To give you an idea of how bad things got, the Elixni devolved to a point where they would cut off the lower arms of those amongst their species who failed in their duties, as a form of new terrible punishment. This was known as docking, and it came hand in hand with demotion. Only when one had proved their worth again could they be promoted once more, and only then would the docking caps on their arms be removed, and they would be allowed to regrow them. The Elixni would travel in their catches, the great ships at the head of their armadas, to the Sol system, and it was there that they would find humanity in disarray, the Traveler all but dead, and new territories ripe for the taking. When they entered the system, the Elixni were a force of remarkable strength combined, and if they had acted as a single cohesive unit, they would undoubtedly have been able to conquer the system in any manner they deemed fit. However, the Elixni had travelled to the system as a group of houses, each representing different cultures and crafts. By the time that they had arrived in Sol, it seemed that these houses were too divided internally to act as a unified force, although granted, this is mere speculation considering the fact that humanity at this point still existed, meaning that the Elixni must have scattered and divided in some manner. So it was that the different Elixni houses spread out and began to make smaller conquests in the names of their rulers. Some, like the House of Rain, would go to conquer the smaller prizes, such as the World of Mercury. Other more ambitious houses, such as the House of Winter, would go out to conquer Venus, the jewel of the system. The House of Wolves would opt for a more cautious approach, spreading themselves out across the Jovian moons. The House of Kings would form bastions across the entire system and would decentralize their operational base of power to ensure better odds of overall survival. And the House of Devils, the most infamous of the Fallen Houses, would land on Earth and put the Golden Age city of London to the torch before eventually migrating and settling their house into the ruins of the Cosmodrome in what had been known as Baikonur in Kazakhstan but to the people of Earth in that time would once again be known as a part of Russia, Old Russia as they would have called it. Remember that in this time period, humanity had lost most of its records of what came before, and so records are scant and scattered. The fact that they related Kazakhstan as a part of Soviet-era Russia once again is perhaps not surprising. So the Elixni would have their first encounters with humanity, and so humanity would come to know them not as Elixni, but by the moniker that had universally been given to them as both title and slur, the Fallen. But the thing about the Elixni is whilst they were divided by their houses, they would all have arrived here in Sol for a single purpose. Though they might have lost their focus in the long dark voyage to Sol, and whilst their rulers at the time might have at this point all been looking out for themselves, there was still an element that could unify them or at least could be used to keep the dregs in their lower ranks quelled and obedient. That was, of course, their shared dream of one day reclaiming the Traveler, the Great Machine as they put it, which now hung over humanity's great bastion of the Last City, defending them. However, for the Fallen, there was a problem. The Traveler, in its dying breath, had not only saved humanity, but had given them a remarkable boon. It had created strange flying creatures that were presumed to be autonomous robotic drones. These were called ghosts, and they could act as conduits for the Traveler's truer power, the light. The ghosts, however, were not as much of a problem as the ones they resurrected. These immortal champions could wield the powers of the Traveler through its light, and they were known, eventually, as Guardians, though they started out as light bearers, without any real affiliation. The Guardians were the staunch line of spears that would not break so long as they defended the last city. No Elixni save for maybe the mightiest of their ranks could stand against a Guardian in combat. Even if they were to succeed, Guardians could be resurrected almost without end. Fighting a Guardian was dangerous and costly, and most often they came in fire teams of three or six. 
The only true way to kill a guardian was to kill its ghost after they had died, thus rendering them both powerless and mortal. To say that humanity had a smaller, more elite force is absolutely an accurate description as a result. A force that the Elixni were unwilling to tangle with unless in the most dire circumstances. And so, the two sides to our great battle have been explored, as has the prize of the battle itself, the Traveler, or the Great Machine, if you're an Elixni. And yet, the battle that would occur between the Elixni and humanity at Twilight Gap was not the first of its kind. It would not be the first skirmish between humanity and the Elixni, it would not even be the first large-scale attack by the Elixni on the city. Battles such as the Battle of the Six Fronts would be forerunners to this event. And yet, the Battle of the Twilight Gap stands out amongst all of these. But why is that? I think the answer to that really comes down to three things. Firstly, it's the scale of the battle. How close fought it was, and how it defined the narrative of these two species. When it comes to the scale of the battle, this was not simply a band of fallen raiders or even an entire house of fallen. This was the closest thing that the fallen had ever formed to a united front ever since they entered the Sol system, and therefore it was truly a bit of an unprecedented event. This was a united front of the four largest fallen houses left in Sol at the time, the houses of devils, kings, winter, and wolves. Now, thanks to a certain Queen of the Reef out in the asteroid belt, the House of Wolves never made it to the battle. But regardless, the Houses of Winter, Kings, and Devils still took to the field united, and in this they represented possibly the greatest accumulation of Elixni left in the universe. Most certainly, it was the greatest accumulation of Elixni that had ever been seen in Sol, ever since the first days of the migration had seen the Elixni spread out and follow each of their Kells to their respective prizes. This was, and still to this day is, the last great army that the Elixni had ever assembled as a united species. The one that not only represented their last best hope to reclaim the great machine, but also represented the first time in many generations that the Elixni had banded together for the cause that had first united them as they left their home system. This was perhaps a truly defining moment for the Fallen Houses, regardless of outcome, as they finally had the ability within their grasp to take the Great Machine back. Secondly, one has to understand how close this battle was. At the time, humanity was still in a place where it was vaguely recovering from a variety of wounds, both politically and militarily. The timeline of Destiny isn't crystal clear, and the spacing between these events might have been substantial enough to mute their effects, but we know for a fact that the Battle of the Twilight Gap took place after the exile of the warlock Osiris and the defeat of humanity on the moon. Osiris's exile was a political schism that split some Guardians away from the governing consensus of the Last City, and caused a number of the Guardian protectors to develop an attitude that was distrustful of their leadership. One could argue that this sentiment might have grown even if they'd not exiled him, but essentially this left humanity in a place where the unity of the City's protectors was somewhat shaken. Now, one can certainly debate the requirement of unity for a force to cohesively fight. After all, each individual Guardian was an elite protector all in their own, and small fire teams of three or six could hold down certain areas with ease if they were coordinated in their small blocks. This seemed fine and reasonable. Though, if their unity wasn't that important to the fight, their numbers and martial power overall certainly were. And this is why we need to take into account the failed assault on the moon that humanity undertook. This assault was so disastrous that it's literally called in Destiny's history, the Great Disaster. An army of a thousand guardians gathered under the Cormorant Seal with the intent of reclaiming Luna from the Hive. The Hive were another alien race with close ties to the darkness, and they had infested the moon to an extent that was unknown to the Guardians. However, an army of a thousand Guardians, immortal slayers of gods, was surely enough. Unfortunately not. When they arrived, they were decisively beaten back by a Hive God known as Crota the Light Eater, the son of the Hive's almighty sovereign, Oryx the Taken King. Many Guardians died on his blade and had their ghosts murdered to prevent their resurrection, meaning that their deaths were final. Legendary Guardians such as Wei Ning and Gonvor the Dawncaller met their fate on that day, 
and ultimately the Guardian armies were evacuated from the moon and retreated back to lick their wounds in the last city. Following this, the consensus was so shocked by the disaster itself that they declared that no official Vanguard support would be offered in any cislunar operations going forward. Alongside the sizable drop in manpower that the last city would have seen, one has to also understand the kind of burden this puts on the heroes of the tower who survived such a battle. The Guardians up until this point had been seen as immortal, unwavering, and impossible to defeat. The Hive on the Moon had shattered those notions for humanity, and showed them that the Guardians were indeed still truly vulnerable. It shattered the fragile idea that humanity's protectors were an indomitable shield that would never be broken, and as the threat of the United Fallen Houses loomed large, these losses in both troops and morale were sure to weigh heavily on the defenders. All of these factors contributed to making the battle so very close to being lost that there were multiple factors that only barely led to the battle's outcome. The margins of victory or defeat were so tight that they rested on the backs of a single fire team in the end. Let me be clearer about that. The margins of victory or defeat were so tight that they rested on just six Guardians' shoulders. Imagine the scale for a second of that, if you will. There were three fallen houses assaulting the city, which one could estimate represented between a million and three million fallen troops assaulting the city. That's based on estimates of the size of the force brought to bear by the House of Wolves. Yet the battle's actions would hinge on the actions of just six individuals. Numerically, that's quite a terrifying feat, and putting the power of an individual guardian aside, this is the equivalent of a battle in World War I, such as the Battle of the Somme, being decided by half of a single British Lance Corporal's 12-man squad, known back then as a section. Remember that there were an estimated 3 million soldiers in the Battle of the Somme. Imagine just you and five others deciding the outcome of that battle. The margins of this battle were on a knife edge, they were so thin, and the stakes were essentially everything. I think the third and final reason the Twilight Gap really stands out is that the battle itself ultimately would define the narratives that I talked about at the very beginning, the narratives of these two warring species. For the Elixni, victory would have meant redemption and reclamation in a most legendary manner, but it would also potentially offer them a chance to reunify their entire race. Elixni legends spoke time after time of the promised messianic figure known as the Kell of Kells, one who would unite the disparate houses, rise to a station above all others, and who would be acknowledged as worthy of the title by the Great Machine itself. Myths like this ultimately served to remind the Elixni of their heritage, and it gave them hope that they might perhaps be worthy of the Traveler's benevolence once again. However, humanity also had a strong cultural narrative involving the Traveler, and it involves not only the Traveler dying to save them, but also the release of the ghosts and the creation of the Guardians, immortal warriors, great protectors that could be the knights in shining armor that the city needed for their defense. Not to mention that in the studies of history we can see that this was the first and only time the Traveler had ever done this, and therefore humanity was truly unique amongst the species that it has previously blessed. The Traveler, for whatever reason, had seen humanity as worthy, and thus such gifts were blessed to us, while others, such as the Elixni, were abandoned. Two powerful cultural narratives would come to clash alongside the armies at Twilight Gap, and much like those armies, only one of them would reasonably be considered the victor by the end of the day. So now you understand the scale of the Battle of the Twilight Gap and why it's best remembered. But how did it, all of this happen? What actually went down? Well, it started with the union of the four great houses of Elixni, which gave humanity a variety of unintentional warning signals. Guardian hunter scouts throughout the system likely reported fallen craft converging on Earth and the last city well in advance, and so the defenses of the city were prepared. The leader of this defense was a figure of legend, the Iron Lord Saladin Forge, who had protected the city since before its great walls had been raised. At his side were another pair of respected titans, Commander Zavala, who would one day go on to ascend to the position of Guardian leadership, amongst the Vanguard, and Lord Shax, a former warlord of Old Earth whose skill in battle and raw determination was legendary. 
Together, they would stand side by side with legendary guardians in their defense of the Lost City. The details of the battle itself are often fuzzy, to say the least, but what we do know is that the Fallen Assault eventually reached a tipping point at the defensive weapon emplacement near the city's border that would give the battle its name, Twilight Gap. Originally, the Fallen were gaining ground, and their victory seemed all but assured. It was with this realization that Lord Saladin communicated for the fire teams holding Twilight Gap and the weapons platforms there to retreat and regroup. Lord Shax was leading the six Guardian fire team at Twilight Gap, and upon hearing this, saw that this order would inevitably lead to the defeat of the Guardians as they would lose ground to the Fallen, and eventually this would mean the last city would be raised and the Traveler would be lost. This was a fate that he could not allow. The battle might be all but lost, but he was determined to give all that he could to defend the place that he and so many others had come to call home. In spite of the continual orders to retreat, Lord Shax's bold commands inspired his fire team, and so, with Lui Feng, Nkeshi 32, Anna Bray, Abdi, and Truce, Lord Shax held the Twilight Gap. His fire team died over and over again, back to back a dozen times. And the amazing thing is not just the fact that they held, but also is how strange and different the members of the fire team were to each other, and yet they were united in common cause. One merely needs to consider Lord Shax and his record as a great warlord titan who would have previously roamed the Badlands of Earth and controlled great territories there, and compare it to someone like, say, Anna Bray, a hunter who delved through ruins and was looking for the link to her past with her family, the Clovis Bray Corporation, and everything that it held, and then compare them to someone like, say, the Titan Lui Feng, who was a mercenary sunbreaker, who sometimes would have been given rest and hospitality within the city and other times would have been turned away and called a renegade. All of these guardians, however, united in defense of a simple idea, home. Great feats of light Nyon heard of before were seen on that day, not least of which was performed by Anna Bray, who would channel the Traveler's light into the typical Hunter's Golden Gun. However, the power of her Golden Gun was so legendary that supposedly where she fired it, residual light could still be found to this day on the battlefield. Light that, in the story of our own Guardian, we would have been able to find. They fought doggedly for every inch of ground, giving barely anything to the numerically superior fallen forces. But in time, the sheer stubbornness and determination of Shax's brave fire team paid off. The fire team had given Saladin the time to rally the remaining Guardian forces in the city's Ridgeback district, and a decisive counterattack was launched to fully blunt the assault at Twilight Gap. Now joined by Saladin, Zavala, Andalbrask, Saint-14, and many other legendary guardians in the defense of their home, Lord Shax's fire team began pushing back the fallen houses until their assault was broken and their resolve shattered. Many guardians suffered final deaths that day, meaning that they could not be resurrected. But as the dust settled on that day, the Guardians had won a victory that would ultimately change the balance of power within the solar system forever. The Houses of Devils, Kings, and Winter would never again launch an assault of this scale on the last city. With their dreams of unifying their race under the Great Machine now destroyed and scattered to the wind, the Fallen Houses once more retreated into ruling their petty fiefdoms, and were sent on a death spiral from which culturally they would never truly recover. Even now, years later, the fallen houses that fought on that day now all stand either dissolved or assimilated into other houses that have sacrificed their old divisions as well as their unifying causes beyond that for the need of survival. The last city, on the other hand, would continue to move forwards, and despite the great losses suffered on that day, would see the battle as a reminder that though humanity might not be unbreakable, it would still be a force capable of fighting for its own survival. Humanity would commemorate the battle in many ways, not least of which was the creation of the most infamous weapon in the history of destiny, the Yalahorn. The weapon would, much like Twilight Gap, stand as a symbol of survival, honor, and the power of Guardian's light. But it would also be proof of something far more profound. 
It was by devotion, bravery, and sacrifice that the heroes of the Twilight Gap bought humanity its future that day. And it was through the light of the Traveler and the incredible powers that it had granted to the Guardians that such a future would continue to be kept safe. Politically, the Battle of the Twilight Gap was a rebuke of the Elixni's long-held belief that the Great Machine was theirs to reclaim. But in the fated legends of the Last City's heroes, it indicated clearly that their destiny was still to remain as the vigilant protectors of all that remained of humanity. To the Guardians that remembered it, and to those newcomers who are told of its legend, it would be seen as a sign that as long as even a single Guardian of staunch heart remains on the field of battle, the day is not lost, and victory can still be attained. But what happened to the Fallen in the aftermath? How was the Yalahorn made? Who stopped the House of Wolves from joining the battle? Did the last city ever fall to foreign invaders? On my channel I cover this and many other mysteries from the alternate universe of Destiny. If you enjoyed the video and you want to learn a little bit more then feel free to take a look at the rest of my content over on my channel. Much like the team over here at the Institute, I'm one for regular long-form content and I was so delighted to be able to make this video in collaboration with them. Of course, you should also go ahead and take a look over at my channel for the Templin Institute's own video that they did on my channel, which is part of their Arsenal series. Something that you might want to watch if you want to learn a little bit more about the fabled Yalahorn. Thanks again to the Templin Institute, remember to subscribe to them, to like this video, and to leave your own thoughts down below. They've been an absolute pleasure to work with, and I look forward to hopefully seeing more of you all in the future, whether it's here on the Institute's channel, or in the alternate universe of Destiny. But in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Baif, Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.